So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Denise Augusto. I am the director of the master's program, the master's of Masters of Science and Information here at Drexel in the College of Computing and Informatics. And you can see I'm keeping one eye on the waiting room as I'm talking, but welcome and thank you. Today is the first of a two series webinar, a, two, a, a double webinar series, the hiring outlook for, U, for HCI UX professionals. Um, and I'll give you information on our second session, which will be February 23rd at the end of the program, if you would like to join us for the second program. Let's see. So today is the first of two sessions. The first is today and the second is Tuesday, February 23rd. And as I said, uh, this program is sponsored by our Drexel's Master of Science in Information, uh, the HCI UX Masters. If you'd like to learn more about our program, you can go to our webpage here and learn all about our program, our Masters of Science in HCI UX. Also, this program is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel if you want to check out any of these links after the program. Well, today, welcome. We're going to hear from three people who are working in different areas of user experience design. We'll hear from Christine Scheller, Director of Experience Design at O3 World. We will hear from Jean Zhang at AstraZeneca and Tiana Lang at Oculus Virtual Reality. However, her presentation will appropriately be virtual. She's recorded in advance. Let's see, um, we, I realized we didn't discuss our order. Christine, are you comfortable with going first? I mean, here we go. Okay, let let's me do see. it. All right, so we will listen to each of our speakers, then afterward we will take questions through the chat. Uh, and I'm gonna mute myself so that we can hear our speakers. Great, so you want me to start with my background? Okay, awesome. Hey everyone, so great to be here. It's nice to meet you all. My name is Christine Scheller. Um, as was mentioned, my role is Director of Experience Design at a CX agency in Fishtown called O3 World. But my background really has been in building and managing design teams. So um, I've been around the block for a few years and you know, I really started and cut my teeth at Motorola and I kind of was largely focused at working at big companies like Motorola, Lincoln Financial Group, and then kind of stuck with um, financial services for quite some time. And in fact, O3 is my first agency job that I just began this past fall in October. So a few years ago, I had a boss who asked how I might grow my role and expand my impact. And I thought, I don't really understand all this UX talk that I keep hearing. You know, I really am sort of was working from a print first perspective and kind of converting everything to digital outputs and formats. And I, I sort of realized that, you know, that was a space and a place that I wanted to grow and learn more. So in my ripe old age of 40 something, I went back to grad school and uh, just finished a master's in user experience design from MICA in December. And so, um, but sort of, thank you. <laughs> so, but as I was, you know, working through um, that program, I had been, you know, practicing um, and, and, you know, growing my practice and then also teaching others on my team how we could sort of transition to become more sort of user centric in the way that we were framing our problem solving and also in sort of the outputs that we were delivering. So, um, so as I said, I've been at O3 since October and um, do you want me to jump into sort of what I do at O3? Okay, great. So, so as I said, my current role is, is the um, director of experience design and I'm really you know, tasked with leading a team of strategists and designers and we translate business ideas and strategy into actionable design solutions for our clients. So that includes you know, re user research and testing, information architecture and content strategy, wireframing and visual design, prototyping, and then also ensuring that our products and what we're delivering is usable and accessible. So ensuring that we're up to date on the best practices for those. And then I've got my, my hands on lots of other things. So, helping to you know, evolve the firm's brand strategy, working on how we present ourselves and our work to our clients, 
um, partnering in the community. So we're starting to teach UX and um, you know, we've got a pilot program that we're running at Roxborough High School right now, which is pretty cool. And we also do a lot of facilitation of design thinking for other organizations. So we've partnered with organizations like CHOP and the Arts and Business Council. So pretty um, well-rounded you know, opportunity for me and I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying myself in my role. And I've probably said too much, but I'll keep talking until you tell me not to. <laughs> probably it for the intro, right, Denise? Does that sound good? All right, so um, do you want us to ask questions or would you rather tell us a little bit more about what you do day to day or your ideas for people who are interested in entering the field? What's your preference? Sure, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to just kind of talk about, you know, sort of the field and the industry and how I've seen it kind of grow and evolve in particular with UX. Um, one thing is for sure, it's a space and a place that's ever evolving and changing. Um, you know, there's a new tool out every, every few months, you know, where people are talking about um, Canva now. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. You know, last year it was Figma. Um, so it's really hard to keep up with the technology and all the tools that are, that, you know, the practice uses. So I think if you're interested in getting into the field, you know, you've got to keep abreast of all that stuff. Um, but one, thing's, one thing I really sort of learned in grad school is that, you know, it's really about understanding human behaviors and methodologies. And I think he, I read an article earlier this year that talked about that sort of recapped like the best tools of 2020. And it was, you know, that spoiler alert, scroll, 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 it's your brain. So it's really understanding how you can, you know, look at problems from a strategic lens and figure out methodologies to best capture, you know, roadmaps and solutions. And so, we don't just jump in and start, you know, at 03, we don't just jump in and start kind of solving for what a website design might look like. There's a lot of research and discovery in our process. You know, we look at the competitive landscape. We may talk to potentially users and clients. We may lead our, our customers through, you know, workshops, innovation workshops and understanding how we might help solve for some of their business challenges and deliver, you know, digital solutions that they didn't ask for, that they didn't even think that they needed. So it's really about, you know, kind of reframing opportunities and thinking outside of the box. Um, it's really fun. There's never, you know, the same, for me, it's really never the same day twice. The agency has been around for 16 years and we're starting to think about how we kind of operationalize and create process and structure on what it is that we do. So we really can fully educate our partners on kind of what the O3 methods and the O3 ways are. And because there's just a million different ways that we can approach projects. So that's been an interesting challenge. Um, I would say for people who are looking for careers in HCI and UX, you know, again, I would say the most important tool is the brain. Um, you've got to, I think, really kind of figure out what it is that you love about you know, about this industry. You know, there's so many different approaches that you can take. I've partnered with um, strategists and researchers who don't have a fundamental design background and you really don't need to have a design background to get involved. Um, you've got to have, you know, compassion and empathy and understanding what users might expect and want out of experiences that you're helping to shape. So you've really got to, um, Really have, you really have to have a desire and um, interest in understanding user needs at the core. And from there, you can you know, decide if you want to be a strategist and kind of look at opportunities to create roadmaps and project plans and figure out method out, the best methodologies to accomplish a goal. Or you can move into you know, sort of more of the UX side and thinking about wireframing and building prototypes and, and looking at the, you know, mapping out the overall experience and content strategy, or there's people who are just really focused on the visual side of things, you know, like developing design systems and, you know, looking at type hierarchy, hierarchy and color and, um, and that sort of thing. And I think what I've kind of seen trending in the industry in the last few years, and I'll be curious to hear if Jing has this experience as well, is that a lot of the visual design stuff has really become homogenized. You know, we've got like all these toolkits that we can download from companies like Google and IBM and Apple and repurpose things and are really sort of fat. We're getting so fast at building these prototypes and building these wireframes, but everything's starting to kind of look the same. So I'm curious to see if the industry kind of shifts back over to 
more of an emphasis on visual differentiation um, and making design kind of front and center. And that's, I, I sort of really selfishly hope that happens because I, I, I'm starting to get a little, you know, confused about products that I use. Everything is just starting to feel kind of homogenized and the same. So I think there's a real opportunity for, for design in that sense. That's just all I have. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Denise. Oh, that, that's very interesting. I was going to say, um, we have a question coming in. What are some of your favorite resources for keeping up with UX tools and approaches? Oh, so it's hard. It's, I may be biased because I'm, you know, I'm just fresh out of grad school. So <laughs> I really kind of looked at my classmates and my teammates to help with that. Um, I like reading articles on Medium. I mean, I follow lots of different um, groups on social media, the Interaction Design Foundation. Um, UX Collective is another one. Actually, let me see if I, I can maybe post a certain, some resources that I have in the chat. I actually just put some things together for some students that I'm teaching at Tyler. Um, I think there's lots, of, there's lots of stuff out there and it is a little bit overwhelming, um, but I think probably social media might be the best way to sort of keep abreast of that stuff. Fantastic. Thanks. We'll look forward to the recommendations. Sure. Let's see another question. Um, UX seems more like a rigorous approach to design. That said, do you think grad school is a must for people wanting to pursue a career in this field? And no, we didn't plant that question. <laughs> Listen, I mean, I, for me, I was always really interested in becoming a teacher. In fact, I started out as a French major and with a minor, you know, and was looking at secondary ed. And then, my, you know, I came home one summer and my mom said, why don't you just go to art school? Because you know, it's the thing that you've always wanted to do. And I'm like, thank you for giving me permission to be creative. Um, but I always sort of missed out, you know, I felt like I was missing out on the teaching thing. So for me, going to grad school was really so that I could deepen my own personal experience and knowledge base. And then also eventually ultimately be, you know, qualified to teach at a college level. Um, you know, I, I love learning. So I'm like very gung ho about education. Um, I think it really depends on what your goals are, whether grad school is right for you. Uh, you know, if it's, if you want to lead, if you want to teach, you know, probably a very, I would strongly recommend, but if you really just want to be an individual contributor, there's lots of tools and workshops and things that you can take, you know, to kind of skill yourself up. I'm sorry, Denise, if that's not the right answer. No, for that's you. a good answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> See, you get a lot of questions coming here. Um, the next one, okay. what kind of end products do you deliver in your career? Um, so that's a great question. So typically, you know, right now at O3, I can say, and, and kind of I guess over the course of my um, tenure in the UX, it's really been mostly focused on websites. So they can be like you know, marketing websites where you're kind of positioning a company and their products or actual product websites where you're, you know, positioning a product. Um, we just did our first Chrome extension back in the fall, which is pretty exciting. So we're starting to tap into that space. Obviously, mobile app design is something else that we're, we've scoped out a few times. Um, we may have actually done a mobile app or two at O3. Again, I'm new, so um, I can't, may not be able to speak best to you <laughs> historically what the products are, but um, sometimes it's just, you know, user user research and user testing. You know, we, we partner a lot with CHOP and they come to us through sort of an incubation um, uh, or innovation center where they may have an idea about a product and they'll say to us, hey, we have this idea about this product. And so we build a script and we build a story and we, and we create, you know, a very low fidelity wireframe and we test it out with people. Is this something, is this an app that you would download? Would you engage in something like this? So sometimes it's just, you know, a research analysis and playback of, you know, feedback from the field. So it's all different types of deliverables. Here's an interesting question. Um, why is homogenous design bad? Won't the transfer of UX just make it easier for user experience? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I guess because I'm thinking about like, you know, my, maybe my sort of my old school, you know, foundational print design and branding, you know, background. I think it just creates a lot of the same, you know, and, and maybe maybe things can be homogenous in terms of size and scale to, you know, ensure readability and things. But um, it, I think from a brand perspective, you, you really use, you really sort of lose um, memorability and, and distinction. And, you know, when everything kind of looks the same, it's hard to remember, it's hard to really differentiate and distinguish one product from the other. 
So I think it's really, for me, it's about branding. Okay, a couple more good questions here. They're all good questions. Okay. Given the status of the, <laughs> given the status <laughs> of the industry today, uh, what would you recommend is the best pathway to access a successful UX profession? I've got many years of tech background, but my only exposure to UX was in my grad program. Interesting. So I think um, a couple things. One is I would immerse yourself in the industry. So listen to podcasts, attend, you know, local events. Billy Kai, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Billy Kai. They have a really great um, chapter with lots of events kind of focused on UX. AIGA Philadelphia is a design organization near and dear to my heart. I'm the former board president. Your current board president is actually on this call today, Bernardo Margulis, who is probably thrilled I'm calling him out. We'd be happy to answer any questions about AIGA. So really kind of immersing yourself in the creative community, you know, finding, potentially finding a mentor, finding someone who could kind of show you the ropes. Um, there is really no one size fits all approach for education and for scaling up. It, I would say there are lots of, organizations and resources out there. Nielsen Norman Group has certification programs. Um, I, before I went to grad school, did a, you know, a short-term program with MIT. Harvard, I think, is starting to offer this stuff. So there's lots of educational opportunities out there, um, whether you're interested in kind of a short-term sort of, you know, upscaling or long-term, there's probably, a, there's something out there for you. Well, the questions are really coming in. Um, they're all good questions. How about, do you need to know how to code to do UX? How much value will it bring to UX team if you do know how to code? Yeah, I'm like, so not. I, I remember in the beginning of the HTML days, like, all right, HTML, CSS, I got this. You can't, you can't possibly know how to be that super technical and that strategic and creative. It's just, it, it if you're good at one, you're probably not good at the other. If you're good at both, like you're a magical unicorn. Um, I don't think it's necessary to the process. You know, you've got to really have, you've got to ensure that you've got strong partners in development, which, you know, we're fortunate that we have a great development team at O3. Um, it's really about making sure that you're providing clear specifications about how, what the expectations are and what the requirements are um, for delivering development. So, you know, design and development really do have to work closely together to ensure that what you're building is, 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 you know, can be accomplished. It's accessible, sustainable, you know, it passes all the usability metrics and that sort of thing. So I really look to developers to, to bring their skill and craft, you know, as partners on a project. I wouldn't say that you need both skills. Excellent. Let's see several more questions, but I think this one bridges that last question. Uh, how do you bridge the gap between UX teams with all the beautiful prototypes and wireframes and the technical implementation teams who may not understand the importance of little things about experience? Yeah, I think bringing the developers in as really as you can into the process. I mean, I think, you know, with UX, you typically work in agile sprints. And so things can be very quick, but I think sometimes designers get caught in these waterfall processes where they're having con client conversations and they're building, you know, they're sketching out ideas and they're iterating and they're, you know, putting together prototypes and proof of concepts and they're leaving their developer friends out. So to me, the earlier that you can kind of embed them in the process and get them to buy in. So it's not just an, you know, an FYI, it's a, hey, like, what are, what are your thoughts about this kind of approach? Um, you know, really utilizing them and leveraging them early on will create more collaboration, better collaboration, more alignment around the challenge that you're trying to solve and ultimately, hopefully a better product. All right, let's see, more questions. We'll try to get them to them later, but I wanna make sure that we have time sure. to get to, to our other two presenters as well. So thank you so much, Christine. Also one sure. comment, did, cool eyeglasses. I thought you'd like that one. Thank you. I'm, I have a collection of eyeglasses, which we'll talk about another, that's another, that's another webinar. I will share out something that I just created for my students. Um, there, it's a list of design resources. Some may or may not be of interest, but could be helpful to all. So I'll post that in the chat. Put them in the chat. Great. Thank you. We yeah. appreciate it. Sure. All right. Great. Thanks so much. And next we have Jing. Um, you're able to share your screen now. Yeah, I believe so. Let me give it a try. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. Great. 
Perfect. Great. Um, well, first of all, thanks, Christine, for sharing your experience. And I always find um, it's fascinating to learn the background and then the path people took um, into UX, because I think it's one of the most um, fascinating and diverse um, <laughs> group of people. So it's always good to, to learn that. So thanks for sharing. And my name is Jing. Um, I'm currently a user experience researcher um, at AstraZeneca. Uh, you might have heard of it right now because AstraZeneca is developing um, its own COVID vaccine, but uh, essentially it is a, um, a global biopharmaceutical company. You might wonder um, what is a, a drug company doing uh, with the user experience research? Um, it's actually quite relevant. I asked that question myself during the interview, but then um, the, the uh, based on my, I guess, my time there, um, I, I got to learn that how relevant it is because with all the digital um, digital capabilities and digital, um, I think, transformation um, that's impacting the healthcare landscape and then also the expectation of uh, patients and healthcare um, providers. It's, it's very important for, um, for in any, I think, companies in healthcare space um, to, um, to have that, build that capacity in, um, in digital um, experience. And that's what AstraZeneca did. It, it started to build out this, um, um, this team um, to bring that digital capacity. So I'm part of a bigger team called the Global Digital um, let me get this name right. Did you see that global commercial and digital innovation team? Um, I'm one of the three user experience um, researchers. Um, in terms of uh, my day-to-day -day responsibilities, um, I essentially um, 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 lead um, and uh, <clears throat> carry out user experience um, research responsibilities, such as um, writing um, project research briefs, developing research methodologies, um, carrying out the research, uh, helping out with uh, uh, sometimes um, idea ideation and uh, workshops, um, managing um, recruiting recruiting efforts and sometimes working with agencies uh, that help out with that recruiting and screening uh, of the user participants um, and also delivering, presenting and delivering um, the findings out um, and sometimes working with an um, experience design team on, on some early version of the prototypes. Um, and then I, I can talk a little bit about how I how I got here. Um, so I I started my um, academic training actually uh, as a um, I was a I was a mathematical biology undergrad. So uh, at that time, life science was what I, what I wanted to, to do. And then I got into um, UC San Diego. Um, so I was in the health informatics um, PhD program. Um, but what I learned that what I really um, was interested in is the uh, uh, how how technology and how information is helping patients on or doctors um, um, to to make life easier easier for for them. So um, during my um, during my um, academic training and research, um, I put a lot of focus on. Um, trying to um, learn the human computer interaction um, methodologies that I can I can apply. So I guess I always kind of have that. Um, um, practical lens to see what is that I'm, I'm getting that I can apply to to something else. So that's something I think I really kind of a focus on while I was doing um, while I was doing my um, like research focused <laughs> dissertation. Um, at the same time, um, I um, I identified opportunities um, where um, I could work on um, other projects that can give me um, exposure in user experience. Um, I was involved in evaluating the usability um, of the uh, electronic health record system for the for the VA hospitals. Um, also conducted um, ethnographic research um, at a university um, university medical centers. So those are really kind of gave me um, the first taste of a. Uh, UX and then help me kind of identify that this is what I wanted to do um, after after graduating from my from my program and that's what I did. So after UC San Diego, um, I got my first um, um, first job in UX as the first UX hire on um, at Open Clinica. It is a clinical um, trials software company. It essentially develops on um, clinical data capturing tool uh, for clinical trials. Um, so I was uh, kind of like the one person UX team. So uh, it, it was <laughs> um, it was demanding at times, but it was really kind of gave me the exposure of, uh, of UX and how it can bring value to the entire um, software development um, development chain. So I got to work with a uh, um, with a business owner on, on identifying the uh, business directions. 
um, I got to work uh, with the um, um, with the end users of the tool, which are a lot of uh, clinical data managers, um, and then also work with the product owner and then the the UI. UI people, the developers, um, to kind of translate because uh, I saw one of the questions kind of kind of bridge bridge those to translate uh, the design and then the intent um, to people who are, have a more technical background to make sure that um, they get implemented as intended. Um, and after that, um, I relocated to the to the Washington, the greater Washington D.C. area. So that was my last job with the Guidehouse. Um, it is essentially. Um, it used to be a PwC um, public sector. It was a consultancy um, that provides, um, I guess, consulting services to government um, to government agencies. So I was uh, working as a, um, I guess, a UX consultant to bring um, human-centered design to government agencies such as National Institute of Health um, and also the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So yeah, so that's a little bit about my background, um, and I thought. Um, I would just kind of put some thoughts to kind of a, uh, even kind of a getting onto the UX journey myself. Um, when I think back, I just pu pull some thoughts, kind of frameworks you to help you um, figure out yourself um, along the way. So I just put some slides together. Um, so I, I'll start with a, kind of one of the my favorite quotes here, which is, uh, chance favors the prepared mind. So, like like anything, I think to to get into the career of UX, um, getting prepared is really important. And then it can be accomplished through many different ways. Just like um, I think you're doing or you're thinking about doing right now, um, having I think uh, some coursework is is important. It just kind of give that structured learning environment. And besides that, um, there are professional societies you can join. Um, UXPA, um, User Experience Professional. Uh, Association is is a good one. Um, I joined their chapter. They have they're pretty active. They have conferences, um, local events, or um, or you can kind of a, a network with the with the people within that within that group. There's industry certifications or certificate you can you can you can get if you find that um, that can give you kind of a. Um, uh, a, a, a cred, uh, can enhance your credential. Um, there's definitely, I think, as Christy mentioned, there's like a tools and then they always kind of get updated. I just feel like it's really hard to keep up to all the new tools that are coming out. But I think the at, at the end of it, it's uh, as long as you understand the principles, know how to use one I, really well. And I think the, the skill set are pretty, pretty transfer, um, transferable. So if you can kind of uh, master at least, you know, a, a few of them for that particular Particular, um, uh, purpose, I think that'll, that'll be good. So don't get over, feel overwhelmed. Um, and then there's um, conferences, there's um, there's online publications or books, and then blogs um, that that you can you can follow. There are people who are kind of online to 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 show, show showcase or share their best practice and lessons learned. I always find that that pretty helpful. Um, the next one is to um, invent your UX identity. Um, I think, as I said earlier, I think one of the fascinating thing about UX is the uh, the richness of the background people bring in. You might have a very different background. You might think it's not relevant to UX at all, um, but you can always find um, a ways to to make that relevant. Um, and then just as an example, um, I, I did kind of this exercise myself, where I kind of just like just be honest with, with myself. Um, and then just to remove all the other external um, factors that might impact me, just like be honest with myself. What is the, um, what are those things that motivate me and then can make me happy and can get me passionate about um, going to work? And then what are uh, some of my strengths that are something that I find easy that just comes natural? So I kind of did this exercise, um, just put them kind of on the board or, you know, just to put that together. So from there, you can kind of start to um, build out this uh, evolving and, and also iterative um, identity for yourself that's going to help you um, guide your later development. So this is one exercise you can do. Um, and then the next one is once you kind of have the identity kind of formed, and uh, I, I like to kind of take it um, against, so that's kind of more internal, right? So now I kind of wanted to, uh, this is just an example, right? To find something like, like a UX, um, 
job matrix or this is kind of the continuum of the UX spectrum from strategy research all the way to kind of a product to uh, down, down the road, you can kind of uh, keep that UX identity of yourself in mind and to see kind of where you map out the best on this continuum. So you can kind of start to identify your niche, something that that's very unique of you. That's like that. That's so, you know, your that's yours. But at the same, same time, I think it's also good to know kind of the boundary because um, um, I personally find that um, if I want to do everything, I always feel like I'm catching up. I always kind of don't feel that um, confident. You, you might be different. Some people are more fluid than others. I think just kind of know that what's that sweet spot for yourself. But then at the same time, like what, what's the boundary? What is too much? You know, because if you want to do prototyping, you want to do research, you want to do coding and then be a UI developer, um, that's um, that's a little bit a little bit much. Someone might might be kind of unicorn that can do it all, but then just know what's that comfort level for your boundary is. Um, the next one, <laughs> sorry, I'm a Attack on Titan fan, so like I'm like into the final season right now, so I cannot can't help uh, join this analogy. So once you kind of have all those identified, I think it's a time to kind of wrap it up, um, put it all together to develop that UX like character and then your your backstory. Um, as you can see, um, I guess if you play game or look at a kind of character design, there's always different ways you can kind of optimize your skill skill sets or or maximize your kind of a, your 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 level so kind of a going along that thought um you can kind of start to have that um concrete but succinct um message for yourself that's kind of serve like almost kind of like a brand like brand strategy that's you that you can kind of uh, um, um, use consistently throughout your job search that can influence um, how you do your 30 second elevator speech that might influence how you present yourself when you have interviews um, or in your kind of a uh, UX portfolio that can kind of guide um, what what type of keywords you want to use what kind of story you want to tell yourself and then why why you are the um, you, you're the right candidate for the job. And then um, it just quickly kind of going from that preparation to the to the next step, right? So um, my second favorite quote is opportunity favors the bold. So once I think we do that preparation, I think it's all also very important to um, to be bold, um, to be the bold person. Um, something to kind of a, to what we always struggle with is I don't have experience and then this job requires experience, you know, but like, what, what do I do, right? Um, one thing I found really useful to just kind of um, uh, create that experience for yourself. If you're in, in your school, in your program, you already have everything you need because there are projects, um, there are things you already know how, how to do. So you can use that to your advantage to um, to work on school projects and make sure that uh, you, you can start to kind of accumulate that case study um, or project e examples. Um, there's always families and friends who might need help. Like uh, I heard an example of uh, someone's friend is building out a pizza delivery website. You can kind of help out to do that. That, that can give you an experience. If you have a hobby group, that's uh, that that's something you can think about because this is the kind of some kind of a something I brainstormed um, for you to kind of as a starting point, you can think about all the different um, different ways that you can gain that uh, hands on experience, even when you're uh, in, in school, when you feel like you don't have the experience, there's always I think ways to create that experience. Um, you can work with the startups or nonprofits or do pro bono work, there's always small business that don't have that big of a budget. But then if you present it to them, say, hey, I got this coursework, I, I want to contribute uh, to you, I'm not going to charge any Thing. They, they really um, would entertain that idea. Um, and then another idea is DIY, do it yourself. Um, I actually saw this example from um, one of the candidates I interviewed. Um, he he was still in the in the program. He just found a website that's really poorly made and then applied um, the usability heuristics that he learned and then redesigned the, the website using wireframes and all that. I was really, really impressed on how, um, how creative he was able to kind of just uh, doesn't need anything else, just to find find something for himself to kind of uh, do that exercise and then and show me the before and after. And, and my last uh, last one here is kind of a more kind of a going towards like now you if you're looking at looking looking at job opportunities uh, what are the different um, places that you can look at and I I still think like it's important to um, to be bold um, and then look beyond the the norm right usually people will probably think about the 
tech firms, Google, Amazon, you know, all those tech firms that have a big like UX um, budget and have a UX um, big structure UX team. Um, I also think like, uh, um, and Christine can speak to this. I think agency consulting firms are a good place to do that as as well, because you also get a, a like a variety of a projects that you never get bored <laughs> bored with that. Um, sometimes um, because I'm have a more of an academic background, I do see universities have their own initiatives as well, depending on what they want to build. There might be a specific website they want to build out. There might be a specific research they want to carry out by building out a particular app. They always need to kind of hire someone to do the job. So those are places to look as well and because i worked with uh, the public sector um sometimes they don't necessarily i guess hire ux as the uh, their internal employees but they do work with our uh, government contractors to to provide that ux resources so that's that's a place to look as well um and then also for more traditional companies that they usually have that IT technology or digital innovation groups de departments. That's where I think some of the UX folks might reside. Um, again, you can always go into academic research, um, doing um, human computer interaction research or informatics or information information science that that you can um, continue to further develop and utilize your your skill set. One area and also also noticed as a kind of potential um, uh, job opportunity is uh, UX platforms. Um, I started using usertesting.com for, for some of my work. Um, it, it turns out that they have all these people who are their own researchers who um, who help clients like me um, to to um, to learn how to how to implement my research and methodology um, by using user testing testing.com so that's another i think um, potentially especially there are so many um, more ux uh, related platforms and tools out there they're always looking at people who know the um, theories of ux and also can help clients to implement their ux um, practices and you can always do freelance. I saw, I think, a question about uh, whether you can do UX part time or not. And I, I think I've talked to people who, who are kind of doing UX by them by themselves. They charge clients um, by the project or by the hour. So it's totally an, an opportunity. And the last one is um, make your own, especially I think for for people who are switching careers. If you're already kind of within a company, if you don't want to like um, go to different companies. Sometimes I think if you have the skill set and if you can kind of make a business case, why they should invest in UX. Um, I've also seen cases when when people kind of go from one job function within the same organization um, to um, to a more UX um, related um, position as well. I think that um, that concludes <laughs> concludes my my talk. So I'm just gonna stop sharing now. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jane. Well, we've got quite a large number of questions coming through, so let's try some. Um, a couple of people have asked about the market for junior UX positions, saying that perhaps the market seems to be more open for more senior positions. What about the junior level? I think there's a there's a need for a junior, junior level as well. I think. Um, uh, I think senior level people, I think more experienced, right? But then I think it just depending on the, the company's budgets and all, all that, I think there's a, especially I think um, uh, there's there's a variety of opportunities. And I think sometimes title is it just a title. <laughs> I think it's more important, I think, to understand like what the job entails and then whether you can um, fulfill those responsibilities or not and what, what you can bring uh, bring to that, um, to that particular position. So. Um, don't just like, because I guess be intimidated by, by, by senior. You touched on this a little bit, but somebody asked the best way to showcase user research on your digital portfolio. Mm -hmm. what, what would you suggest? Wireframes can be quite large. This question says, how about just a screenshot or should you submit the whole thing? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it depends on how 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 detailed that particular company wants to kind of get into it, and I think a screenshot I think would would uh would work um pretty well, especially I think if you're really get into a research focus focus role, I think the um the key key to address there is to um you know, how, how you take a problem, how you solve it, what's the methodology, what's the output of it. And then in terms of a research related roles, the output is really not, um, you don't have to kind of uh, 
showcase that much kind of a visual. And then I think it's, it, whatever data can help you kind of tell the story would, would be enough. And I've used uh, screenshots before and I think they worked pretty well. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, somebody said I'm changing fields into UX, but all my experience is other fields. Um, should I just not discuss my background or how do I deal with my background being in a different area? Mm -hmm. I, I actually, I think it's, it depends on how you frame it, right? Whether, um, whether you can find that, um, that relationship to, to UX, right? Like I've seen people who are from like English background who became a content strategy, strategist, that's totally relevant. It's really kind of thinking about what is the core skill sets um, that's needed for this job? And then what is that in your background that really shines, that can relate to this particular job? And then I think this is where you can kind of pick and choose. You don't have to talk about everything, but then um, being able to kind of make that, make it relevant and make it a convincing story is, is more important. You can have any other background. You, you don't have to have any, you know, direct UX related background at, at all. But then as long as you can kind of uh, um, make the story, piece the, piece the story together for the employer rather than having them piece them <laughs> together, I think that'll, that'll come across con convincing. Thank you. Um, here's a good one for you specifically, Jing. Um, what are some of the recent trends in digital experience for healthcare? Are there certain areas they're focusing on or interventions they're currently trying to implement? How might UX professionals better prepare for healthcare environments? Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting one. Um, it's definitely, I think, in healthcare and in everything else, I think it's going from, um, UX is going from a luxury to necessity. And I think it's just like a patience and people just expect so much more. And I almost feel like there's no way around it. And then um, for, um, for my own work, um, one of the, I think one of the challenge and also opportunity is because um, it's really hard to do um, in-person studies or doing those like field studies and a lot of things are going to go to go digital and being virtual and how can we still um, um, have that empathy and build that out and contextualize um, the data we collect I think it's going to be uh, really interesting and I'm, I'm actually think looking into those um, digital ethnography like tools to see how we can still capture those very rich contextualized um, um, data points uh, to help us inform design um, during during time periods like this. Um, and then because UX is a very collaborative field, um, it's also like a lot of opportunities. This will be kind of a neat question for for for, for Tianyu too, because we're also looking into um, utilizing um, mixed or augmented or virtual reality to to help collaboration of our UX team. Um, so <laughs> this is there's a lot of interesting things going on in healthcare and UX. Great, thank you. Here's a question I think um, Christine might want to take a shot at. What about UX careers is most creative? The processes sometimes seem very scripted or even robotic. Wow, well, that's a little bit subjective, I think, because it really depends on how you define creativity. Um, there's creativity in building strategy and roadmaps and figuring out how you might take a business challenge and turn it into actionable activities, you know, that are UX related. So. For some, it's um, what Jing does research, you know, that some may think that's the most creative. Um, for others, it might be the visual design side. So, you know, being able to create design systems and um, components and uh, maybe even have an impact on overall visual brand and strategy. So I think that's a, it's, it really depends on how you define creativity. All right, I think one more question before we need to get to our, our final presenter. Um, Industry certifications, can either of you provide examples of valuable certifications you think would be helpful? Yeah, so um, there, there's, I think, quite a few out there, and I, I enjoyed um, U.S. and Norman groups on certification. Um, a big part of the reason is I think during the, during the training, um, you're in a in a 
same space with all the other UX practitioners. And then they, they're very research focused. I think they do a lot of research within the UX field that can kind of provide that um, best practice. Um, what's the kind of industry trends? What are the things that they have worked or have not worked? And I, I find it really um, valuable to, to go, through, go through that training. I would, I would agree with that. Nielsen Norman is really, high, really highly regarded in the industry. If you're interested in um, understanding, you know, sort of the mindset around user research design thinking is a really strong foundation and also critical to um, to solving, you know, business challenges. And IBM has a really great platform that's totally free right now. You can get certified and I think they've got four levels of certification, at least the first two are free. Um, and IDEO who is, um, they're kind of sort of, they, they founded sort of the thinking of, you know, design thinking platforms and they've kind of been in the industry for years. Um, they're also highly regarded, not just by creative professionals, but also business professionals as well. And they have lots of um, online classes. Nothing in terms of like a formal certification. I think they may cluster some things together um, and you can get a certificate, but um, I don't know that they have like UX certification coursework, but at least the foundations of thinking like a designer and approaching projects um, with empathy and problem solving is, you know, is a nice foundation to start with too. I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? The second one? The whole thing? <laughs> no, no, just um, the, the second certification you said. Uh, IDEO, I-D-E-O. Thank you. Um, I'm, Sure, I'm happy to put the resources in the chat as well. And we did have a question asking if we could resend the resource list to the participants. We can do that. Oh, sure. Okay. All right. Thank you two so much. Um, so I do want to start our third and final presentation from Tianu Lang, who's at Oculus Virtual Reality. And appropriately, she sent us a virtual version of her presentation. It runs about 16 minutes long, which is going to take us a little bit over time. So I do want to remind everybody um, that to thank you for coming. Um, thank you so much to Christine and Jing and soon Tiano. Again, I'm Denise Augusto. I'm the director of the Masters of Science and Information at Drexel. And we do have a specialty in HCI UX. So check us out if you're interested. And here is the presentation from Tiano. All right, uh, since we are recording now, um, all right, let's get this started. Hi, everyone. I am Tianyu. Um, I am sorry that I have to meet you guys in this way. Um, not able to uh, attend the seminar live because uh, I have some schedule conflict. Uh, but thanks, Gina, again for having me, for giving me this opportunity and allowing, allowing me to share my experience and thoughts around user experience design research. Um, even through this way. Um, okay, so let's get started by uh, going through my simple deck. I think that will be easier. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, I hope this works out, that you can still see my face. Uh, all right. So a little bit uh, background information about myself. I am currently a UX researcher and program manager at Oculus VR. Um, and some of you might have um, tried it, so you might be able to recognize the virtual background is actually the, the dome home in Oculus. Um, and before Oculus, I was uh, at Google, also doing user research, and uh, as well as Kaiser Permanente, which is a uh, big healthcare um, company here in West Coast and then some of the some states are on the East Coast. Um, and um, my first job out of college, uh, which is Michigan State, where I had um, worked with Gina there uh, was actually at the Age of Learning, uh, which is a company that makes a product called ABC Mouse. And um, it's uh, so they basically make um, educational games for kids ranging from three to teen teenage years. Um, 
and also um, founded this, uh, it's more like a passion project uh, called Dishes. Uh, it's a platform to help people discover authentic ethnic cuisine and learn about the culture and the story behind the cuisine. And during COVID, we pivoted to help um, cooks, home cooks especially, to sell their frozen um, frozen food. So like frozen dumplings, and bananas, uh, tamales, um, and I uh, am basically in charge of the, the whole product and, uh, and the vision for, for our small team. Um, so how I met Gina, kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, is um, uh, from Michigan State, uh, when, uh, where I got my master, first semester um, there. And, um, I already know that uh, um, for the program in Michigan State, uh, we have the specialization in series game designer research, and, and that's also kind of why I, um, I picked my first job in uh, educational games. Um, so I was really lucky to be able to do something that uh, really aligned with what I have learned. Uh, and then just in 2019, I um, decided to go to business school, um, partially because I um, was doing dish roots. I know how to make products and create a good experience about it. Realized I know nothing about making money. Um, <laughs> realized that also um, it's, the business the business is very well integrated with um, the, the uh, design of product, which I will talk more later. Um, and also just to want to expand my uh, network here in Southern California, um, where I really plan to uh, stay for a very, very long time. So uh, anyway, I'm doing my part-time MBA uh, with, uh, I'm at UCLA. Um, and uh, it's a busy life because I have full-time job and I do classes that, uh, in the evenings and weekends and there are a ton of homeworks and assignments and Zoom uh, doesn't make the experience any better. I'm sure uh, this can all resonate, but um, I hope it will all pay out in the future. Um, and um, so I think the prompt asked me to talk a little bit about my day-to-day -day job. Um, I would say, um, so my job has two parts. One is program management. So I manage this uh, bi-weekly rolling research program that's serving a, a, a big organization. So we have um, like five participants, five users come in every other week and we have uh, different teams and stakeholders sign up with their topics that we, they want to uh, put in at the sessions. and. Um, so I managed that, that program um, with a partner with our third party vendors and um, so for that part of the job, I uh, oversee the process, you know, try to optimize the, the pipeline to make it more efficient and also maintain a close relationship with all our stakeholders and make sure that um, Make sure that our program is serving their needs and also uh, our input um, input from the research sessions are um, being uh, implemented in their um, design and, and product work. Um, and also um, doing some UX consulting for different teams and just trying to understand the where they come from, what's their, what are they looking for, is rolling research a good approach, or should they do a separate standalone study, um, who should they talk to, because like being in a position also gives me the unique uh, opportunity to be able to see topics across board, across different teams, so sometimes um, teams are in kind of a siloed mode that they don't even know that their other teams are doing similar jobs or uh, works that might have impact on their work. So I um, oftentimes will do, uh, oftentimes will connect the dots and um, and also connect the dots uh, of in our knowledge base and uh, point people to things that that they uh, that we previously had research on and um, so. Yeah, some UX consulting, um, and uh, that also uh, is for my kind of second part of my job, which is I am also an embedded researcher for a specific team. Uh, so for that uh, position, I um, am in 
you know, very close partnership with our internal uh, cross-functional teams, including um, engineer, um, design, content design, uh, product management. Uh, so we constantly meet and um, here are here uh, regularly meet and uh, discuss the roadmap, the priorities, and um, I uh, basically am the owner of the research and roadmap and strategy. Um, and sometimes I will conduct the research myself as well, or find vendors to uh, to run the research. But um, I uh, definitely own the piece of um, communicating with stakeholders uh, before and after the actual sessions. Um, and uh, uh, I see a lot of my job actually has overlaps with product man management, and I am um, in very close relationship with our product manager. Um, um, and for this shoot, I'm basically doing the product management work. Um, so um, those are kind of the main areas of my day-to-day -day job. Um, and then I think another prompt uh, was to talk about um, what do I see the next trend in UX? And I definitely think that um, UX and the business are going to be more intertwined. And, uh, and there's, especially for UX professionals, it's uh, almost like, impossible to just to focus on user experience um, and I think what makes um, what what makes UX some UX professionals stand out is that they uh, are able to uh, distinguish the business problems and people problems and be able to articulate um, those different problems um, and uh, be and uh, being able to kind of see the UX impact on business objects. So first of all, you have to be able to understand the business objectives and are what are the and then uh, what are the you know what are the the key metrics that we're tracking, um, right? What are the um, the key uh, business areas we want to grow and why and how um, our UX work can help move the needle in, in those uh, objectives and also being able to uh, kind of advocate for yourself and strategize your own work to uh, maximize your impact on the solution approach. Uh, and that will involve uh, storytelling with different types of data, qualitative, qualitative quantitative, um, pitching, the, pitching your solution um, to different stakeholders um, using you know, storytelling or other ways. And uh, when there's trade-off for your solutions um, and you, you know how to negotiate, with different um, partners and also after you have done some research following up is so important to make sure that um, those findings and recommendations are well integrated into um, the actual actionable items and making real impact in um, in, in those those business objectives uh, and another important i guess um elements in this whole, uh, in all those activities is being able to uh, identify your allies and the patrons. Um, so in, and I mean, I don't, I don't want people to connect with this with like, um, kind of stereotyped uh, uh, bureaucracy in um, organizations, especially big organizations. I don't think those are the same. I think in any organization, even um, small or nonprofit or just um, or just um, a, a, a project that you uh, need to be able to identify who are your allies and the, like, who are your patrons and how do you how do you approach them? How do you kind of leverage the relationship um, to help you and others succeed? Um, so um, yeah, I think those are all kind of um, examples or actual uh, overlaps between the UX and business. Um, and here's two uh, resources I, I, uh, I recommend. Uh, if you guys are interested, I can take a look. One is a medium, I think it's a, the, the, a blog, and the other is a, a podcast from Envision um, Design Better. 
of program. Um, okay, how to do those? How to get there? I think some of those will help. I'm not gonna read through those, um, but um, in a high level, on a high level, I think uh, always take time to listen and understand. Don't jump in a solution too fast. Make sure that you understand all the context, um, including the, the problem, the, the people, um, and uh, try to learn some business language and uh, speak those in your communications. So, um, you know, if you talk to um, data science, um, then you got to know like what is the basic uh, basis of um, running experiments, A-B testing, what are the key analytic metrics that we're, tra we're, we're tracking. Um, and for marketing terms, like in uh, so marketing, basically there's the acquisition and retention. There are also a lot of um, activities and different terminologies in, in those uh, two different um, main marketing activities and making sure that you also know some of those. Um, and uh, uh, depending on the company and the product phase, and there are different growth strategies. Um, so um, understanding the different uh, growth um, pattern of strategy also will help you kind of be able to understand the business objective from a higher level. Um, and uh, uh, lastly, I want to just highlight this very powerful and useful tool called the Product Requirement Document, um, PRD, um, which is like the Bible for um, kind of for, for any, any new feature or product. Uh, if, if you Google online, um, you'll be able to see like what is a PRD, um, what are the main parts in a PRD. Um, I think there's uh, this product school, they have a free book around uh, for product management and one chapter, particularly when a very in de a very detailed um, for the product required document. So just that's a good resource for you to understand that. So uh, my recommendation for um, product requirement document is just to always read it with full intention, slow, uh, made multiple times, um, make sure that you uh, always um, ask the why um, when you read it and understand um, where, where the, all the context and if you if you have doubts or you have different opinions and you want to get more clarification, uh, ask your product manager. Um, be highly involved uh, if you, you are able to be highly involved in the product requirement uh, document development process, uh, making sure that you uh, get the chance to voice out your questions and uh, if there's always, I mean, not always, but most times like you already has a um, UX design and research um, segment on the, the portion. So um, if you are able to be, uh, make sure that you uh, contribute to those parts um, and also um, you supply the PRD mindset or framework in your own research plan or design document. Make sure that um, you know specify what are the goals, non-goals, um, what are the hypotheses, where do you get those hypotheses, how do you plan to validate those hypotheses, um, and what are the impacts um, of the research for uh, different organizations. Um, it's just a really great uh, framework to help you um, sharpen and hone your, your, your thinking process. Um, all right, I, I wasn't looking at time, I was like, I didn't go too long, but um, I'm sorry, I can't be there to answer any of your questions, but um, if you have any questions or comments, um, here are the two uh, places you can find me. Um, all right, so, okay, let me stop sharing so I can say bye um, with my big face. Uh, not big face, I mean, relatively bigger than the small screen. Um, okay, um, thank you all, bye. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. Um, let's see, with that, we conclude our program. We will send you the, some of the resources mentioned tonight, as well as a link in case you'd like to go back and watch the video. It usually takes our staff about a week to get the video edited and uploaded to our YouTube channel. 
And again, um, contact us online if you want to if you want to chat. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much to Christine, Jing, and Tiana. Thanks, everyone. It was fun. Yeah. Good luck. Bye. Okay. Bye.